traveling is his profession. Bradley Mayhew writes tourist guides, mostly about Asia. This time, he is working on a very special project, an adventure, an experiment. He retravels a route taken by a merchant from Venice more than 750 years ago. He is happy with any transport he can get. Always east along the Great Silk Road. Through remote mountain ranges, inhospitable deserts and ancient cities, Bradley Mayhew follows the route of Marco Polo. From Venice to Beijing, through countries such as Iran and Afghanistan, 10,000 kilometers overland, a journey as great an adventure today as in Marco Polo's time. not the worst time of year to make a trip to Venice. Carnival is when Venetians really let their hair down. The costumes and the, the masks are so colorful, they give you a real exotic feel of what the city was like in its heyday when the Silk Road trade connected Venice to China, and this was the place to be in the world. It's also a great place for taking photos. From here, in 1271, a young son of a merchant embarked on a journey that would eventually pass into legend. Bradley is looking for traces of the golden age of Venice, when families like the Polos traded in silk, spices, and precious stones, which were transported by caravans along the Silk Road. It was this long-distance trade that made Venice's fortunes. Luca Zentellini, publisher and antiquarian, collects original sources about the 13th century, the time of Marco Polo. All over the Mediterranean, all over mm -hmm. from, from Constantinople, from, from yeah, Echo, from Laos. Yeah, uh, yes. well, Constantinople and Venice was the, the, the biggest market in, uh, of the time. Uh, Venice be, became the biggest empire of, of, of the Middle Age. Right. It's, it's incredibly, because this small town became something with few people. Medieval Venice is well documented, but not much is known about Marco Polo. Preserved for posterity is his book, The Description of His Travels. It exists in more than 100 versions. Some of them are richly adorned, while from others only fragments exist. Take this book and have it read, and here you will find all the greatest marvels and the great diversities. That's nice. It's, it's really amazing, you know, how, how young Marco Polo was when he set off. He was only about 17 years old, almost the same age as when people leave school these days. You know, so it's a, he came back and wrote this incredible book with all this geographical knowledge that inspired everyone from, you know, the Columbus took a copy of Marco Polo's travels with him when he was headed to the, to the west. So it's an amazing impact this, this one man has had. I'm sure this is the book I would like to read. And wow. then the antiquarian comes up with something quite this special. Is the, this is the your version. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to find this for the longest time. An annotated edition of the travels of Marco Polo by Henry exactly. Yule. That's fantastic. Dating from the year 1871. That's great. Thank you very much, Luca. I'll be You're reading welcome. this along the Silk Road. You're welcome. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye-bye. I 
I first read Marco Polo's book uh, when I was studying at university, and it you know it really really epitomised the dream of travelling through Asia at that time. It had all the wonders of the of the region, had all the romance and the colour of the Silk Road. Uh, so yeah, it really spurred me to want to go and see you know what what is it like? What's Asia like these days? I've been, I've been to a few countries on the road, uh, but doing them all together in one long trip, that's what's exciting. You see the gradual change of, of cultures and countries from the Turkic world to the Persian world to the Chinese world, and, and that's, that's going to be really exciting. It must be somewhere here in the quarter of San Giovanni Chrysostomo. The gondolieri know the site where the house of Marco Polo once stood. As a child, he must have played at the side of this canal. His father, Niccolo Polo, was constantly traveling abroad. He was one of the first Europeans to reach as far as distant China. Now he wanted to go back, and this time his son was to accompany him. Young Marco didn't have any idea how long this adventure was to last. So when the Polos finally returned home to this gate after being away for 27 years, they were refused entry. No one recognized them. They were probably wearing long Mongol cloaks, big heavy beards. They'd aged by almost a quarter of a century. And no one really recognized them. At some point after his return, Marco Polo was taking part in a naval battle against rival Genoa when he was captured. It was in prison that he dictated the book that would make him famous, and which in Venice gave him a nickname, Il Milione, the Millions Man. The Venetians called Marco Polo Il Milione because of everything was described in gigantic numbers, thousands of armies and soldiers and horses. No one really quite believed what he was talking about. Either way, his departure from Venice is historically documented. They're made recently, or do you also have antique? What would the Venetians have worn at the time? Nobody would know better than Stefano Nicolao, Venice's most famous costume designer. Is this something that traveler during Marco Polo's era would have, yes, would have yes, worn when sure, he was traveling? Sure. He started okay. from Venice with these costumes and they go to the China. And Bradley what wants to know from which material the clothes were made at the time. The from wool mainly, it's Stefano it's explains. It's like, like this coat, for instance, over, more of a cape, really, warm, and very warm, and open in the front uh, and at the back for ease of riding. And on his legs, what would he have worn underneath them? Oh, for the leg, they use uh, like uh, stockings. OK, right. Complete, you see. Uh, ah, I see. Yep. This is the. So this is like the heel. Yes, okay. the heel, and the the lace on the on the belt, and the fix ah. just on the side. Okay. So, the summer, spring, winter, yeah. now in the autumn, maybe they have the same costumes, the same dresses, right. and they just put over something more, yes. or take off and rest just in shirt and you know. We can start from this. It's a, about a, a long shirt Okay, you can put on. Then Stefano wants to see what Bradley would look like as Marco Polo. Well, this is a much heavier... Yes, and have something about this hat. Okay. It's very comfortable. It moves and flows yes, easily yes. if you're moving or you're on a horse. It's, yeah, it's lovely. So, how do I look? Very good. <laughs> you can go to the China now. Yeah, this is good. I could travel in this. It's a, it's a little bit heavier than my Gore-Tex jacket, but still, well, it's pretty good. Well, for the long travel, it's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go. Most likely, Marco Polo left Venice in a convoy of trading and war galleys. Today, ferries cover the route across the eastern Mediterranean. Bradley writes mainly travel guide books for the Australian publisher Lonely Planet. It's a very 
strange life. Half the year you're, you're traveling and seeing exciting things, meeting people, it's very intense stimulus. And then for four or five months of the year you're at the computer 15 hours a day, you don't leave the house, you don't see anyone. You, uh, you lose your suntan, you come out of the, of the house blinking into the sunlight like a little mole. You know? Bradley Mayhew, 40 years old, British, married and living in the USA, is a professional traveler. But retracing the route of Marco Polo will not be an easy task. There are over a hundred different versions of Marco Polo's book. It would have been copied by hand at that time. So a lot of the spellings, a lot of the, the, the route information is slightly different with each version. So trying to match up the name that Marco Polo saw and the map, the name that's the modern name on the map, that, that can be pretty tricky. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen, all for free. No subscription required. Acre, the ancient Ptolemais, founded 4,000 years ago, is today located in Israel. Here, the Polos stepped onto Asian soil for the first time. They came to meet the Pope's representative before continuing on with their journey. Back then, 40,000 people lived in Acre, whose center is still the ancient Crusader castle. When Marco arrived in Acre after his long sea voyage, the city was really the last bastion of Christendom in the Holy Land. The Crusaders had lost Jerusalem and they were planning to try and retake it. So you can imagine that this citadel would have been full of thousands of knights dressed in their suits of armor with uh, soldiers, monks, pilgrims, visiting royalty and uh, traders from Pisa, Amalfi, Venice. It would have been a very busy driving place. And a place under imminent threat. The secret escape routes are still in place. For more than 100 years, Acre had been the capital of the Christian kingdom in the Holy Land but the Crusaders were not able to hold the fortified city. It fell in 1291. So by the time Marco got here, Akko had changed from being the gateway to the Holy Land to being the last bastion of Christianity here. Within 20 years of his arrival, the Mameluk armies were here at the gates. They were outnumbered 100 to 1, and after a two-month-long siege, it was all over for the Crusaders. Acre today is a sleepy port town in the north of Israel, close to the border with Lebanon. Bradley is looking for a place to stay. Walid Hachalil has got a vacant room for him. Okay, great. Uh, one question. Yes, um, I'm trying to find some places that have some connection to Marco Polo when he was here. There are Marco Polo Road Street. Marco Polo Street? Right? Yes. Do you have time to show me that later on? Today? Yes. Walid grew up in Acre, a city strongly shaped by the close proximity of different religions. The line between peaceful coexistence and conflict is a fine one here. In the old quarter of town live mostly Arabs, Muslims with an Israeli passport, but not many civil rights. Israeli soldiers are a common sight in the souk. When we've been reading a lot about Marco Polo, we've been reading about the 13th century. It seems to me that there was much the same situation then. There were holy wars going on, there was fighting, battle over the Holy Land. It's almost the same now, 2,000 years if, later. If we go back, few thousand, you can see all the people in the world try to come to fight and to occupy in this area. Why? I don't know. Maybe because they are Holy Land. Right. This is all. The soldiers are training to be frontline reporters. In the souk, they are practicing to take pictures and videos, they tell Bradley. 
I'm a, I'm a photographer also. They are taking mostly photos with some video. The army has provided them with simple cameras. Exactly. We have this. Good enough for training, reckons Bradley. Exactly. Acre is not a political flashpoint, but for the people who live here, the Middle East conflict is part of daily life. So you're saying that it's like fighting between two brothers? Of course. They are two brothers, I'll fight for one home, but they have to come to the end. They have to sit in the tables, this your piece of land, this is your piece of land, sit quiet and that's all. If they make a peace and they open the border from Russia and Ukraine, in half an hour from Akko to Lebanon, half an hour, yeah, to the first uh, city, Tour, where my uh, sister lives. You miss your sister? You haven't seen <laughs> her for so long? I don't see her since 82, 83. I'm sorry to hear that. This kind of life. Her father died in 88. Mm. My father did. Mm. And she couldn't come to visit also. Mm. This kind of life, my friend. Today, modern trains run along the Mediterranean coast of Israel. The Polos must have traveled here too, though in less comfort. On his first journey, Marco Polo's father, Niccolo Polo, had received a special request from the Chinese emperor. From here, the Polos made a quick detour to Jerusalem to run an errand for the Great Khan, pick up some oil from the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And that's where we're headed now. The Holy City, bone of contention between religions since time immemorial. At close quarters lie Christian churches, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the most sacred place of Judaism, the Wailing Wall. The Jewish quarter adjoins the Muslim quarter. Muslims consider Jerusalem to be Islam's third holiest city, after Mecca and Medina. Last but not least, Jerusalem is the place where Jesus Christ was crucified and buried. On this exact spot stands the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Catholics, Protestants, Copts, followers of the Orthodox churches, to all of them this church is sacred. In these lamps burns holy oil, symbol of divine mercy. These lamps contain exactly the kind of oil that the Polos came to pick up for Kublai Khan. It sanctifies from sins. It brings healing to the sick. The oil is believed to be holy. We're not quite sure why, but the Polos must have told the Khan about the oil, and the oil became a symbol of the Christian faith. The Kublai Khan was interested in hearing about all the religions from the world. So it became a symbol for the Polos to bring back some information for the Khan on, on Christianity. From Jerusalem, the Polos most likely continued their journey by boat towards Turkey. Today, that's impossible. Bradley has to come up with a different route. The conflict between Israel and its Arab neighbors makes traveling in this region tricky. A lot of the borders are closed, north into Syria is closed, south of the Gaza Strip is sealed, and then with the security checks and the visa and the Israeli visa stamp issue in your passport, you've got to always keep your eye open, you've got to plan your route and know where you're going in this part of the world. Highway number one in Syria. Bradley wants to travel to China overland, like Marco Polo did in his day. There are no camel caravans anymore, but there are plenty of clapped out buses. They are cheap and noisy, but you do get to know your fellow passengers. A sponge trader, for example. He should buy a sponge for his wife. Bradley does not speak Arabic, but this much he gets.
A friend of Bradley has put him in touch with a young man in Syria who will be his travel companion. Mohammed Sheikh, nicknamed Santiago, studies English literature. He comes from Aleppo. Uh, well, in a, in a place like Syria, where I don't, I don't speak the language, I can't read Arabic script, everything is 10 times more difficult. I was lucky to get on a bus going the right direction. But luckily, I've met up with Santiago now, so he's, um, he's making sure I get to Aleppo in one piece, hopefully at least, inshallah. Is it far to Aleppo? No, no, it's not far. Less than, like, almost one hour or a bit more. The two are heading to one of the most ancient cities in the world, a legendary trading center, today the largest city in Syria. In the heart of the old town towers the citadel. Assyrians, Persians, Greek, later Rome and Byzantium, whoever ruled in Aleppo ruled from here. Many have left their mark on the fortified hill. The Islamic sections of the citadel date from Ottoman times. Today, the fort towers above a metropolis of two million inhabitants. Around 6,000 shops line up along 12 kilometers of roofed alleyways. The Bazaar of Aleppo is the longest covered bazaar in the world. The cloth market is of particular interest to Bradley. Many of the fabrics come from China. Mostly cheap synthetic goods, as Santiago explains. Yeah. If you came here 2,000 years ago, you'd find fabrics from China back then. I mean, in some ways, you know, the design is different, but in some ways things haven't really changed. Yes, yes. Very beautiful. Does it come with the color of your beard? No, I don't think it's quite me, but thank you very much. This is where people come to get their everyday goods. Yeah, every, everyday stuff like what they need uh, to eat, to uh, wear, to, like, to use at home for cleaning stuff. And, then and you get, you get uh, uh, traditional goods like the soap right next to the, the modern goods. You get every, everything. Yeah, you see the, the, the uh, big like, comparison, like contrast between these two stuff. This is not a place that Marco Polo came to necessarily, but this has, carries the flavor of, of what the Silk Road would have been about. But also the Silk Road smell, everything from the soap to the spices, it's, this place is really alive and vibrant. It's, uh, it's great. This is one of the best soups I've, I've ever been to. If you come to the Middle East, this is the place to come to. Good for hair, good for body, for face, for everything. Eight years old, eight star, better quality. The secret of Aleppo soap lies in using the correct ratio of olive and laurel oil. Even today, it is still manufactured in the bazaar. The oils are mixed, the soap is boiled and cut when it has solidified. Faster, faster. Besides soap, Aleppo is well known for another luxury product, which is also produced directly in the bazaar by Mr. Marva Sali Rumir. Oh, he said you can do it. Girls already did it, so you are a man. Oh, okay. so you should do it. That sounds like a challenge to me. Yeah, I think so. It's <laughs> to have the honor. Um, I don't know much about silk itself. My wife will be the one to, to ask about silk, but I'm interested in, in how silk has been become a symbol for the trade on the silk road. The history side of it is interesting. The actual making it like this, I know absolutely nothing about, but I'm learning very fast. Yeah, silk has been essential to the history of this part of the world for the last 2,000 years or so. 
Yeah. All the way coming from China, it's really yes, one of the main reasons that this international trade started anyway. The Romans really was the heyday of the old Silk Road. The silk came from China and it became so popular in Rome that it was slowly bankrupting the entire empire. They thought it grew on trees, like, uh, like cotton or something. They, they didn't have a clue, and the Chinese didn't want to tell them. That was a secret they wanted to definitely keep hold of. A trade, a trade secret 2,000 years ago. And you can still find it 2,000 years later. I don't think <coughs> workshops like this have really changed that much since then. Bradley wants to keep moving. A brief farewell where the overland taxis leave for the border. A short drive through the foothills of the Amanos Mountains, then a final road sign. local buses are called Dolmush. They go to every corner of the country, including the place where Bradley is meeting a friend of a friend. Hey, must be Bradley. Yeah, Yusuf? Yes, that's right. I was looking forward to see you. It's nice to meet you, yeah? Yusuf Sevinchli is a photographer. He lives and works in Istanbul and, like Bradley, he loves to travel. When Marco Polo was here, the place was known as Laius. Today, it's called Yumotalik and is a quiet town of 5,000 inhabitants. Yusuf and Bradley have found a boat to take them to a tiny island bearing the name of Marco Polo. Coming from Jerusalem, the Venetian traveler landed right here in Laius. At that time, Laius was the main port of a Christian enclave surrounded by Muslim Seljuks. The ruins might have been customs buildings but no one knows exactly. What is certain is that at the time of Marco Polo, this was the westernmost terminus of the Silk Road. Marco Polo writes, and The merchants of Venice and Genoa and other countries come here to sell their goods and to buy what they lack. For whatsoever persons would travel to the interior of the East, merchants or others, they take their way by this city of Laius. Marco Polo spent several months here, most likely preparing for the next leg of his journey. It's not entirely clear which exact route Marco Polo took. Bradley and Yusuf thoroughly pore over the maps. From Laius, there are several possible routes leading to the northeast of Turkey. Part of the problem that we have is that some of the places that Marco Polo mentions we can Pinpoint. He mentions, for example, like um, Caesarea or Caesarea. He mentions Sebaste, which is the old it name for Sivas. Sivas. Yep. And he also mentions Azinga, which must be Erzinjan. But some of the names, they Art just don't lost. exist anymore. So it's really hard trying to match them up. So we can also take the short route, shortest route through, through here. I think Marco Polo would have followed the valleys. You know, it makes sense to follow the Euphrates. So maybe we'll try and find a route that connects up through there, out to Erzincan. It is 800 kilometers to the upper Euphrates. Luxury long distance coaches are few and far between where the highway ends and the mountains begin. 
Yusuf and Bradley don't care. They'll take anything they can get if it brings them further east, further along the so-called Silk Road. The Silk Road is, is very much a misnomer. You know, there's not one road. There's a whole network and a whole thread of different routes that go all the way across Asia. So they would choose whichever route was the best suited for that time, for the weather, for the season, for bandits, robbers, you know. So uh, it's, not, it's not quite as simple as it sounds. Bradley also has to adapt his routing to the region's political crises. He has to abandon his plan of traveling via Mosul in Iraq, too dangerous. So he chooses a route through eastern Turkey. Working as a guidebook writer is, is a great job. I can't complain about it. It's a, it's a real addiction that, that gets under the skin. And I think I could never stop doing this now. Even if I wasn't working, I'd, I'd still have to travel. It's, uh, it's part of who I am, really. The road winds down through the mountains. In a side valley of the Euphrates, in the quiet of the countryside, lies an ancient town. In 1228, a local emir started construction on the Great Mosque of Divri. It's not the size that makes this mosque so impressive. The fascination lies rather in the details. Abstract and floral ornaments adorn the portals, delicately carved into stone with the utmost accuracy. You can tell that the Divri is, at the moment, in the middle of nowhere but it must have been at some point right on the heart of an important trade route. You're right on the Euphrates River, and you can tell from this incredible building there must have been some serious money coming through here at some time to be able to afford this and to be able to mix all these different styles. I think this great uh, mosque is uh, more than something, uh, more than a pure Turkish Islamic architecture. It's a great combination, mixture of many different cultures like Turkish, Islamic, Persian, and Mesopotamian cultures, all of them are combined in one building, and that's amazing. This, this mosque was built in around 1220, and Marco Polo must have come round around here around 50 years later. So although he doesn't actually specifically mention this mosque, it doesn't mean that he didn't pass through here. There's a lot of things that Marco Polo didn't quite bother to get around to mention. So he would have come somewhere through here, he would have come up through this high plateau, would have come through here, probably up the Euphrates River, and then carried on to Erzingjan Ezerum and headed east. The next morning, rush hour at Divri train station. The train is at quarter past five. Mr. Aziz, you must meet. He's the driver and he must know. What time? The driver of the train? Yes. Okay. Salam alaikum. Hello, sir. Merhaba. It takes four hours from here to the city of Erzincan, Marco Polo's Azinga. The train stops every five minutes. It doesn't get really crowded. It's easy to strike up a conversation with your fellow travelers, especially if you have some bread, tomatoes, and cheese to share. Adam Kazilgos studies economics in Istanbul, it turns out. 
His hometown is Erzincan, and he returns home whenever he can find the time. Is that where he's from? He's going to visit his parents, but also they are going to play Jirit. It's a kind of old traditional uh, game that you play on uh, riding horses. Can we go and see that? Is that possible? Can we go and see that? Of course. Marco Polo's Azinga. Today, a city of 100,000 people in northeastern Turkey. In Erzincan's Chirit Club, the team is meeting. Adam still feels the effects of the long journey. Chirit is a game played on horseback. It dates back to the time of the Ottoman sultans, maybe even to when the Mongols passed through the region. Over the last few years, Chirit has been staging a comeback, especially amongst young people like Adam. Today, more than 20 club members, aged between 12 and 62, are once again playing Chirit in Erzincan. The name Chirit comes from the red javelins used in the game. Yeah, I've, I've ridden once before in Mongolia, but the horse was, was about that tall, so this is a slightly different uh, kettle of fish. Um, Adam, where's the brake? Brake is here. This is the brake? Yeah. Okay. All right. That, that's all my tuition, is it? That's all I get. Yeah. <laughs> you can go now. Okay. All right. It takes half an hour by horse to get to the playing field. It lies in the center of a rather faceless industrial city that has been devastated by more earthquakes than any other city in Turkey. Traffic is getting a little bit dense now, so I'm going to leave it to the professionals. Traditionally, the game is accompanied by Chenet pipes and drums. Yusuf receives a rundown of the rules. Seven referees make sure that Chirit is played according to the rules. And you have to hit the body. They have to hit the body, not the legs, not the horses. It's like uh, like ritualized warfare, you know, it's like practice for, yeah, for the big battle. Yeah, obviously, obviously it's a war game. Polo's itinerary is not always easy to pinpoint. But here, in the northeast of modern day Turkey, is one place he definitely traveled, together with his father and uncle. In deepest winter. Snow in Ezerum certainly lives up to its reputation. Marco Polo describes the area as the coldest place he experienced on his entire voyage. <laughs> Apart from the cold, the Venetian quite liked the city, describing it as noble and rich. 
Despite its out-of-the-way location, Erzurum prospers even today, and the jewelers who are based in this former caravanserai are making good money, especially with one particular stone, known as black stone. Marco Polo was particularly interested in precious stones, in anything, in fact, that was valuable and easy to transport. The whole Polo family were uh, jewel traders for a lot of their business, and part of his book was really a book for traveling merchants, so he's always describing jewels, local mines, lapis lazuli, pearls from India. It's always in the back of his mind, he's always got an eye open for these kind of things. You can't, he just can't turn it off, it's part of who he is. Jeweler Ali Jelabi tells them the name of the black stone, Altutash. Yes, that's it. I know that the, the Tash means stone, like Tashkent, the city, but what, what's the Altun? What's Altun? Ne demek diyor? Yusuf learns that Altu is actually a town not far from Erzurum and that the stone is mined there. What's the Tash? And this is what it looks like when it comes out of the mountain. It is dug out by hand, 300 meters underground. And all labor work by hand. By hand. First used in the Bronze Age, later used by the Romans. It seems like it reached its heyday in my own country uh, during the reign of Queen Victoria when she wore it after the death of Prince Albert. I didn't know that. That's the, the history of Altu Tashi. We just have to find out where it's mined now. So we got the car, man. Great. Uh, is it a good one? It, not a brand new one, but still, it's drivable. remote. Hopefully this is the right turn. Should get the car? Yeah, let's get this guy right. Salam aleykum like everybody else in the village, Nazim Elibal is a farmer, and like most people here, he works the Altu mines. It takes three hours to reach the mine. Nazim climbs up every day, except when the snow is too deep. A few villagers are working a mine together, Bradley discovers. Yusuf, I think these are my size. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. It's unisex, you know. This particular tunnel is 180 meters long and not particularly safe. And so tight that one must crawl on all fours. Well, we're about 100 meters into the mountain and we still have more to go. It's small, dusty, and claustrophobic, and I'm trying not to freak out too badly. Mm -hmm. 
Altutash, sometimes incorrectly called black amber, is the petrified root of a tree. Okay. Don't get so you, you find a vein ah. of Altutash, and then you have to knock all the way around it very carefully so that you can get the whole kind of the old former tree root and get it out in one piece. Nazim has been working the mines since he was 12. He can almost smell the altutash hidden in the rock. Altutash. So this is the, this is the altutashi. Altutash. Comes, comes out in veins. This ah. stuff is already hardened. It's been in contact with the air, so it's already got quite hard. When it originally comes out of the veins, it's all soft and malleable. It's only when it gets in contact with the air that it takes on this, this hard format. Safi. Mm. Safi. Okay. The altutash is processed right in the village. When first polished, it turns brown. Bringing out the brilliant black gloss of the stone takes time and experience. Well, the one thing I learned was to tell a fake one from a real one, the real one burns. So if you've got some jewellery made out of this, throw it in the fire. If it burns, it's real. The story is that if you give one of these to uh, someone who's caught your eye, that that, that girl will, uh, will be instantly attracted to you. But in my experience, that works with all kinds of jewellery. The more expensive, the better. <laughs> Nazim Elibal has thrown a delicious slab of mutton onto the barbecue and has invited Bradley and Yusuf to spend the night in the village. <laughs> Next morning, they continue their journey through eastern Anatolia. Passing geese on the country roads, and cars in even worse condition than theirs. Yusuf, who works as a photographer in Istanbul, has to return home for an assignment. Before he leaves, the two want to visit one last place together. the deserted and destroyed capital of Greater Armenia. Ani had once been an important trading hub on the Silk Road, home to more than 100,000 people. Three entryways lead into the cathedral, one reserved for the patriarch, one for the king, and one, the smallest, for the people. In 1045, Byzantium took over the city, followed by the Seljuks. Any changed hands all the time, so when the Muslims were in control, the Seljuks converted it into a mosque. When the Christians had the upper hand, they took it back to a church and it kept going back and forth over the centuries. The arrival of the Mongols heralded Ani's decline. An earthquake finished off the city. The Silk Road soon bypassed Ani completely. I think Marco Polo went fairly close to here. He probably didn't go to this exact spot, but he went, he went close to here on the way to Iran. Back in his day, I think this was uh, Greater Armenia, which would have covered everything from what is now Armenia to Eastern Turkey to Iran to Georgia. This whole area would have been Greater Armenia, and he writes a lot about that. Looking around, there's, there's not really that much left, a few enigmatic ruins. The Seljuks took the city, the Georgians invaded, the Mongols besieged the place. But the worst thing has just been the ravages of time. You know, earthquakes have rocked the city, lightning has, has, has struck several of the buildings, and the city just was just left neglected for centuries. So it's a, it's a very enigmatic place.
it's better to have too much rather than too little petrol, especially in this remote region. Pretty much at the end of Turkey, feels like the middle of nowhere. From pretty much here, Marco Polo talks about Georgia in this direction, Armenia over there. He talks about Iraq, Mosul and Baghdad. He also talks about these great fountains of oil. Not good for eating, but uh, good for burning, he says. And those are probably the modern day oil fields of Baku in Azerbaijan. Over this way, he talks about Tabriz in Iran, and that's his probable uh, location of his, his trip. And that's where I'm headed next. Tabriz. Dolm is coming. Time to say goodbye, man. Have a nice trip. Yeah, thanks for everything. Great. Good luck with the trip back and the assignment. They have been traveling together for four weeks. Now it's time for Bradley to continue alone. Marco Polo believed that Noah's Ark rested on the summit. For Bradley, Mount Ararat marks his final destination in Turkey. So this wild corner of Turkey, underneath Mount Ararat, this is a fitting place to end the first leg of this trip. Up next is Big Bad Iran, which I am personally really looking forward to.